All right. Hey, everybody. It's me, Noel Fister. And today I have two very special guests with me. I have uh, middleweight fighter Joe Pfeiffer and director of Journey to the UFC, Chandler Henry. Good to be here, Noah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, you too, Chandler. And nice to meet you too, Joe. Now, uh, today's going to be a little uh, more special as I've had the opportunity to watch the uh, feature-length documentary Journey to the UFC, which uh, was uh, premiered um, back in May and was distributed by Disruptive uh, sports media. And what is so inspiring about this story is it shows a man, Joe, who really just came from nothing, who absolutely worked hard to get to where he is now. It is one of the hardest uh, stories I've had to watch recently in terms of uh, documentary filmmaking, because it shows a man uh, who refused to be beaten. And even once it seems like his career was over, he just took that as a nah i'm gonna keep trying i'm gonna i'm gonna do my own thing and i'm gonna get to where i'm at it is a really aspiring story of determination and i recommend anyone if you get the chance to watch it please feel free to check it out it is one hell of a good time now um let's jump into it um so first uh i'd like to ask uh chandler um what this is uh, obviously you directed this movie, so I'm wondering what drove you to uh, to 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 meet up with Joe. What 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 caught your attention with his story? Well, I think a lot of people ask that question, and it kind of dives into Joe's and I's relationship because this isn't. It's not like I'm some big established director that was out searching for the best story and found Joe and recruited Joe. And no, we've been friends for a decade. We met in high school when. You know, Joe was obviously, you know, training for fighting back then, but he wasn't a professional fighter. I didn't know anything about directing a film. And for like the first four or five years of my our friendship, like there was nothing involving work. Like we were just friends in school and things like that. So um, as I started a YouTube channel and got into cameras and things like that, one summer I hit Joe up and was like, hey, man, I got a new camera. Let's go film some stuff. I think we can make some cool stuff together. One thing led to another, and we ended up making a documentary, an hour-long documentary back in 2018. I don't even know how that happened. We just kind of did it for fun, and it ended up making a pretty big splash, especially with how powerful Joe's story was. But that was five years ago. I was using a cheap camera. I was just learning how to do this stuff. And in those five years, that documentary that I made on Joe back then, he used that to help me get my first job out of college. And I started working with people in the UFC and, and big names and stuff like that. And in that same five-year gap, Joe's career, he was exploding, you know, having a lot of gains. And like you talked about with his story, there was also a lot of adversity. So once Joe really, I don't want to spoil Joe's story, but once it, you know, reaches it, its climax, I go to Joe and I'm like, hey, man, I'm better at making documentaries. Your story has gotten a million times more powerful and better since last time we made a documentary. Let's do it right this time. And I have all the gear, I have all the experience and new skill to make this big and do it the right way. So I expressed that to Joe and he was on board and that's how we got started with this project. Well, that's really interesting. I had no idea you guys were actually friends up until, uh, up until now. Um, yep. Now, uh, Joe, the, the documentary goes into your background in high school. Um, and it seems that from birth, you have always been a fighter. That is just that that is what you were born as. And that's what you're bred as. Uh, one thing that the documentary didn't necessarily dive too much into was your fighting styles. So uh, when you train, what is your biggest focus as a fighter? I mean, if we're talking from a technical standpoint, I would say probably my defense. Um, I pride myself in not getting hit that much. So, um, as far as like what I work on the most, I mean, I can't really narrow that down. I really um, I'm well diversified in, in, in everything. Like, I never wanted to just have a couple pieces to the puzzle. You know what I mean? I want it to be complete everywhere. I want to blend it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, if we're just talking about, you know, technical and skill-wise, I have to say a lot of what I work is uh, distance management and defense. 
That's really interesting. And um, is there a, now what is that now someone who is clearly um, very unaware of how working out and like dieting works? What sort of diet or like food sort of management does that require? Do you uh, do you carb load and then work out or do you work out, don't eat, then work out again? Like what is what does your diet mainly consist of? Yeah, I mean, when I'm in camp, uh, it's, it's a lot of carbs. I mean, obviously a lot of protein. It really depends on what you're burning throughout the day. Um, so tracking your calories and your macros really helps and understanding what you're actually burning so you can properly refuel and make sure that you're not in a deficit. Um, you know, it's dependent upon each person's body. Um, each is different. And uh, I mean, it's different for me. I burn at least um, anywhere between you know, three to 5,000 calories a day just between working out. So it's a lot let alone I have resting calories when I'm sleeping. So, so it's really just about narrowing that down, tracking that. But yeah, high, high in protein, high in carbs, high in water intake. And, uh, you know, try to get on the sleep schedule, which is most important probably over everything else. Well, unfortunately, I cannot relate to that as my sleep schedule is just permanently screwed because I work night shift. But, you know, I'm hoping, hoping I can fix that soon. <laughs> um, um now, uh, after seeing you fight, uh, just during like during some of these training montages within uh, your documentary, um, it actually kind of got me wondering, Chandler, you've watched Joe fight, you know, and train. Have has the curiosity ever like arisen? Like, have you ever actually stepped into like a, a sparring session with him just to kind of like see what his talent is like up close, or have you always been like, you want to know what I'm? I'm not gonna try. I don't want to get my ass beat. Never voluntarily have I been involved in training with Joe back in high school. I, I, so I'm like six foot eight, six foot nine. And back in high school, Joe and I had gym class together. He would pick me up over his head and like, you know, clean me and then drop me and catch me before I hit the ground. Now I was like 230 pounds. Um, but no, I would never fighting is something that, that blows my mind because the way that they can take in what would be, a, a traumatizing, terrifying event for an old person and do it on a daily basis is something that I can't relate to and, and really is unbelievable to watch. When you were just asking him about how he works out while training for this, I mean, while, while filming this, like when we were in Philadelphia the other, Joe was doing two a day workouts and each one looked like it would have me beat for two weeks. And, you know, you do the workout, you come home, you shower, you eat, you recharge, rest for a little place in video games you go back and do it again in the same day. Like it is unbelievably grueling stuff. So I played basketball my whole life, but even in high school, when Joe was on the wrestling team, there was a track above the basketball court and we'd watch how these wrestlers train. And if I thought basketball training was hard cardio wise, man, the level that these athletes are on, it, it's seriously another level, level of grueling physical fitness. So to answer your question, I would never voluntarily train with Joe when it comes to sparring. I mean, we do some workouts together, but you know, I have no experience in the, in the fighting area. You know what? That is more than a fair enough answer. Um, <laughs> but going back to the high school stuff um, now, Joe uh, will uh, your, your former coach uh, was, is, was uh, seen as a huge part of your life growing up. Um, I'm guessing, do you still keep in contact with him to this day? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, that's somebody that without him period, I wouldn't be here. Um, so I would have never had the platform or the time to develop skills good enough to make it to the UFC or dedicated as much time as I needed, or let alone probably have been able to, you know, sustain a healthy living environment throughout my injuries when I didn't make the UFC on the first try. So um yeah i mean i'll never lose contact with that man he was uh, a blessing from god sent into my life that you know uh, early enough age where he can make a huge difference and uh i love that man so yeah yeah we of course we stay in contact and that's always really good to hear um do you ever call him up anytime like if you're ever feeling conflicted or like just like ever feel like you don't know where you're going do you just call him up and ask for his advice um Honestly, no, uh, because I feel like I have a good enough head on my shoulders and part of being a functional adult. You know, if I ever thought I had to, I would. But, you know, 
I, I live a very simple life, man. I don't I don't really go out, don't party, I don't drink, I don't do bad shit. I don't hang around people that are doing bad shit. So I don't really have any um I guess words of advice that I've needed lately. Um, unless it's directed towards MMA. And fortunately I have people that are very um experienced in that area that they can help me with that. So, you know. Uh, but no, I, I would say no, I don't I don't. That's actually a really interesting answer. Um, and all things considered, um, you show, uh, considering you and I are pretty much almost the same age, uh, it's it's kind of amazing this level of maturity that you're showing when it comes to how you're tackling, you know, your career as a fighter. Because I'll be honest, if I was in your shoes, I would, I, I am, I am an immature, immature ass when it comes to some of these things. So I'm wondering how how do you like get in that headspace of of like kind of like tunnel vision of knowing exactly what you want while also maintaining that level of you know maturity and grace that you've shown both inside and outside the octagon yeah i mean here's the thing like i, I want to give as most the most genuine answers that i can give right but sometimes i get annoyed with interviews or with people that ask me questions because i don't i don't know how much people really listen and i speak from the heart i speak from wearing my heart on my sleeve so i i'm, I'm super focused because my name has never stood for anything that's good. My last name isn't known for shit. Isn't known for anything, college degrees, good dads, good grandfathers, like nothing. They're they're all pieces of shit, like literally. Let's just put it that way. So when when I look at my last name, I want to be somebody that took my name to the highest level, that elevated, elevated it, made it stand for something good, made it stand for something that's worth um, you know, going back and saying, man, that, that was, that was a crazy journey. Can you believe that this kid came from this came from that and look at what he did, you know? Um, and when I think about would I rather risk going out and getting in trouble or doing some dumb party shit or hanging around the wrong crowd or doing the wrong thing, or, you know, just fucking off basically with my youth, I don't want to grow old and look back and be like, man, my youth is gone. I'm old now. I didn't do this, man. I didn't take this shot because I was scared. Like nothing's the bro. I'm going to shoot my shot while I'm young and I'm going to try and see how far I can go. So, you know, it's just me. I think to answer your question, I think the focus comes from being afraid to grow old and have regrets and I don't want to have any. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, I've also been in the sport since I was four and a half years old. Thanks to my dad. You know, it's the one thing I can say that he did that was good. And uh, he gave me basically a, a toolbox uh, with no tools in it. And I got the tools and started building my own life. That is a fucking awesome answer, dude. I have nothing but respect. Nothing but respect. And honestly, that kind of brings me to um, another point, which is essentially, um, you know, it's like, don't worry, channel. I'll get back to you. I promise. I promise. But um, Joe, you you talk that you have this mentality of uh, representing, uh, you know your your name in a way that is meaningful, not just to yourself but to others in a sense. Like um, you mentioned when you finally won, you know your contender series, you said no lost kids left unfound or a lot some along those lines. You don't get better. Exactly. So it's I am wondering, you know, it, it, winning. When it comes to winning, I'm guessing there's more importance than just like a number on like your on like your score. Is there something more like like what does winning mean to someone like you? It changes. Like I look at winning. Like I don't care about money, you know. And that, but I'm not dumb with my money. Like I understand that I need money to survive, to live, to have the things I want. I like cars, you know. I like shit like that. And, you know, vacation, like you have to pay your way in this, in this life. Unfortunately, that's the game that everybody is born into. It's not natural. And I think a lot of people get caught up into living that life, thinking that that is the only life, you know, I th that's not what we were born to do. Um, and, uh, shit, did he freeze? Can you hear me? Oh, no, I can hear you, man. So, Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, good. No, yeah, you're, you're, you're a fan like froze. I was like, oh, shit. Um, so I think a lot of people are caught up in this thing where they, uh, where they think that this is a normal life, like going to work, working a nine to five, making money, like, dude, like normal life is 
without any of this government shit, without any rules, you get to live off the land, live off, off animals, shit like that. Like very holistic, very natural, very naturistic. Um, you know, you, you kill what you eat and, and things like that. Um, or you eat what you kill. Um, so it's like, I think people get caught up in this fucking like fantasy world that they think that working a job is fulfilling and things like that. Like me going out there and winning just allows me to go see the world. And, and I'm coming around to my point is like, I, when I win there, it's, it's so many parts of it. It's not fuck the win itself over that guy. Fuck the guy that I just beat. I don't care about him. I care about the fact that I won and I'm able to make enough money to go and travel and see the world. Like that's something I really want to do. I think if I don't go and see this globe and see what this world has to offer and the sights it has to offer before I'm dead, I feel like I'll have failed. So, um, you know, winning to me allows me to bring myself peace of mind and like that, that um, fulfillment in my heart and that area. And then also all the people that ever invested time in me, anybody that ever believed in me from the beginning, you know, um, it, it, it's a win for them too. You know what I mean? So I try to share it with as much, many of my friends as I can, um, you know, Chandler included. And, uh, you know, I've also shared my success with him and, um, you know, I wouldn't be here without him as well. Everybody's played their part, man, in the right way and everything's come to fruition, but you know, winning is much more than just that fight for me. It's everything. It's my whole life. That is, that is beautifully put Joe. I can't, I can't lie. And you know, you've mentioned sharing it with others and it's, it's a very, uh, it seems to you, it's a very selfless act to win. Cause you know, it's, it's more than just you that's winning you, you're including everyone that's had the influence to make you into this fighter that you are. And, you know, watching your documentary, seeing this progression, it does make me wonder. Um, and, and Chandler, this question is more for you. Um, how, what was it like you know, you, you've known Joe for so long. You, you've seen him, you know, you've seen him go up, go down and go even further down, but also rise back up. So in your own words, how would you describe Joe's transformation, both as just an individual, as a man, but also as a fighter? I mean, what what's interesting about that question is that Joe really hasn't changed at all when it comes to who Joe is. He's the same exact person that I knew in high school. Now, is there differences with how he fights and, and you know, all the adversities that overcome that does change you, but he hasn't lost himself in that. So it's been amazing to kind of see that, like, you know, when Joe broke his arm and, and you know, couldn't train and, and things were bad. We were on call of duty at night, having fun. And, you know, now Joe's in the UFC two and O verge of being a superstar. We were on call of duty last night, having fun, you know? So it's like, he hasn't changed in the essence of who he is and the selflessness in who he is with how he shares things with others at all. But seeing him grow as a fighter has been phenomenal. I mean, I could talk about that stuff for a while, like technical stuff. Like, you know, I remember when Joe was coming up, I was, you know, all over social media, Joe's number one fan. I had people like, you know, messaging me like, oh, Joe can't box. He's only a wrestler. And now like, you know, he's known as a knockout artist, not a wrestler. So I've, it's been awesome to see his growth and how he's grown as a fighter with the route that he has. But I think to answer your question, the most amazing part to witness is that when Joe and I are sitting on stage at, you know, a pr world premiere of a film we made together, being interviewed by Laura Sanko in front of a crowd and we're talking to her on stage, it kind of feels the same way that we used to talk to each other when we went to the lunch, when we had lunch in the library in high school. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I appreciate the most. And even going back to your friendship with him, you know, you are a filmmaker and, you know, the one thing uh, people like Zack Snyder have said is that you know, one of the best aspects of being a filmmaker is your POV, your point of view. Um, now, being his friend, being uh, being this part of his life, did that influence at all how you approach this documentary? And if so, you know, what exactly was it you were trying to have people take away from? For sure. And that's a that's a really good question. I remember talking about that earlier, is that when you're watching this documentary, you're seeing Joe how I saw him this whole time. Like when I'm watching these things happen to him, like when the falls happen in that documentary, I want you to feel 
like people watching this, lots of them might not know Joe. Some might, some might not. But I want them to feel the devastation that I felt when those things happened. I want people to cry like I cry when those things happen. I want people to cry tears of joy when the success happens. So my goal in making the film and, and how I structure it is, you know, I, I don't want to be too specific for people who haven't seen it, but we want to meet Joe and build him up as an unstoppable force, right? When I met him in high school, like if you're walking around with Joe, you're safe, you know, if, you know, you're, he's the man, no one can touch Joe. And, you know, taking all my friends to his fights in Atlantic City and, and in Philadelphia, and he never loses. And then seeing the the actual essence behind the unbeatable, like, you know, superhero that we're all seeing and seeing that fall and, and you know, and then seeing a rise that's even greater than the, than the first peak we saw. And so I want to make sure people see the depth of Joe and, and really start rooting for him for when we're in the documentary or down those really low moments so that they can come with us on the rise back up and really feel the way that I felt like you were saying, like my point of view, witnessing his journey. That's, hey, that's a freaking great answer, my guy. And honestly, I really felt that watching it. I felt like you were taking us along with him to watch this journey of of this man, of this that's essentially a fighter born and bred, um, if I'm not being repetitious. Um, but you've mentioned something that was very interesting. You mentioned that this was all about his rise. I actually, Joe, I want to talk a little bit about your brief your brief fall. Now, um, uh, during your first attempt at the Contender Series, you dislocated your elbow in rather glorious fashion. Um, and I can't even uh, begin to imagine, you know, what that must have been like. Uh, pain wise, because I'd rather not want to think about it. But um, something that was only, I think, briefly touched upon was, you know, the recovery process. We talk, talked about the surgery, you know, there was bone growing where muscle should have been. Um, now, I have a, a sister who uh, wants to be a PT. So I would like to know, what was the physical therapy process like? And what was the most challenging aspect of it, in your opinion? I mean, the, the most challenging part about it is that you were prying an arm, almost like imagine being arm marred and you're tapping and you're saying, oh, I'm done, I'm done. Like, you know, imagine being joint locked. I don't know if you know what an arm bar is, but if you get arm barred and your fucking arm's about to snap and uh, you're screaming to tap and somebody's still prying on your arm and then they're putting weights in your hand. And, um, you know, I cried through many of those sessions and then my arm is bleeding because the incision you had to get, you had to try and get the mobility out of it immediately so my arms all in this guy i had a surgery seven days ago too by the way <laughs> um, um, but you know uh you know they're sitting there and they're prying against my arm and, and they're make, trying to make me move it and my arm is still not straight you know what i mean so um it is what it is it, it was just the most mentally draining mentally exhausting physically demoralizing um like body dysmorphia feeling that I could have had ever in my life. You know, at one point I could put my fucking hand almost around my bicep because my, I had no muscle in the arm because I was immobilized for three months before I could even do PT the first time. And then I did PT and, uh, for the first surgery and, you know, I was starting to get strength and everything. And then I, I wound up joining Marquez and started working with John and them. And first time I hit pads, I was like, man, like, I feel like I'm gonna break my arm. Like, I feel like I'm gonna break my arm. I was like, there's no, like, I'll never have a career if I can't, if I can punch like this, like, there's no way. Went and got an opinion from the same doctor, the first surgery, he said, oh, no, nothing's wrong. You're fine. It's just, car it's just um, scar tissue and all this shit. So I went and got a second opinion through Richard Tosti. And, uh, you know, that man has been the saving grace to my career. And uh, he saw that there was like some shit that was messed up with a bone growth and things like that, let alone I still had a torn forearm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, dude, like when I say it was some of the worst pain of my life, you know, it was some of the worst pain of my life because it, it was such a long process because I tore tendons, ligaments, muscle, the joint itself. Uh, and then I had screws and a plate. So it's like, man, like I just, I got hit with everything. It's one of the worst injuries you can have to your elbow. So, um, yeah, but the PT was rough. Oh, sorry. Sorry for my reaction. It's that, you know, it's you watch this sort of injury and it's uh, 
It's like watching us. It's like, it's like watching someone ostrich their legs. It's like knowing that an arm's not supposed to bend that way. It just, it's, it was yeah. a bit of a, it was a bit of a yikes moment. So it's, uh, it, you know, I am sorry that you still have to, you know, get surgery. I know that it's still an ongoing process to try and, you know, I, I don't uh, want to. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Getting this is, this is my good arm. I got surgery on. That was Ooh. this arm. Yeah, this was this. Look at that scar. Oh, good God. Oh. <laughs> and I have one that's this long on the inside, but I'm pale as fuck, so you can't see it. But they just caught me seven Wait, days ago. I didn't know that it was your good arm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good arm what? Look at that. I told you. I just assumed I knew you were getting surgery. I was like, oh, it's probably on the arm that, you know, snapped in half. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, so just to clear that up, since I'm showing it, is my left arm. I, uh, me and Sean Brady were training one time uh, about a year ago and I felt like a pop in it. And ever since then, it didn't quite feel right. And then the more I punched, the more I punched, the more I punched, it was painful, painful, painful. And then, uh, in this last fight, I didn't even obviously get hurt, but like throwing it, it just like, it never stopped going away. I had like this nerve pain. So, um, you know, I told the USC right after the fight, I was like, man, like my hands like tingling and shit. So uh, I went and got an x-ray and an MRI and I had a bone growth that was impeding on my nerve and my bone. So every time I was punching, I was literally digging the bone into the nerve. Uh, and then I had two bones first. So I had two things that they had to shave down and I broke a piece of the elbow off the back. So everything, unfortunately it was a lot, but everything that happened was all bone structure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's why I'm moving my arm around and everything like that, because uh, it still hurts like a motherfucker because my incision isn't done and my bones all bruised and everything like the camera don't do justice. But this is all like brown. Um, but yeah. So, yeah, I got another surgery. <laughs> and the UFC's uh, got to watch out. We got two bionic arms. <laughs> there no, you go. No freaking kidding. This dude's a cyborg. Um no, that's oh, I had no idea. I honestly, I too thought that was uh that was the same arm. Ah, oh, good golly gee. Um, oh, all right. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure good out where I'm supposed to be. What the fuck? <laughs> look, I, I look. I'm trying to. I, I <clears throat> sorry. I know that's a that's a very uh, that's a very like a 1950s dad thing to say. Oh, good golly gee. Um, all right. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked. Uh. What was, what was I talking about? All oh, right, uh, PT. So um, I'm guessing there is still some lingering pain uh, f uh, just from time to time, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have pain the rest of my life. I'm going to have arthritis and shit like that. But it is what it is, my man. It's a short life, not a long life. Uh, praise that. Um, so, um, sorry, going to Chandler, uh, this may uh Chandler. So um when you got this what is that? What is that rise? It's banging, bro. Wait, hold on. That's a wait, hold on. I'm sorry. This is an actual sidetrack question. Is that like a is that a, like a beer, a sports drink, or like a like water? I'm sorry. It got I'm a little bit. drinking no beer, dog. I'm drinking a salted caramel nitro cold brew coffee. It's oat milk. It's shit slaps. If you want it, get it. All right, this is sponsored, but sponsored by Rise. Uh, get, go check it out. If it's drank by a fighter, it literally is good. I was gonna say we gotta we gotta get a sponsor first before we plug. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> no kidding. <laughs> oh, actually, speaking of which, channel, I wanted to go back to you real quick. And um, so uh, it was mentioned in the press release as well as at the premiere that this uh that this film you made was in help made by Disru disruptive sports group. What was working with them like? Awesome, man. Like I knew nothing about them at all. And then Joe went and met with them. And I remember because he um he was sending me a Snapchat. He was like, I'm on my way to Austin, Texas. And I was like, what the heck? And he wouldn't tell me what he was doing, but he was like teasing me. He's like, it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be really awesome. <laughs> and then uh, – I was like digging around and trying to figure out what was going on. And I finally, cause he was like, I'll tell you tonight. And I called him. I was like, yeah, tell me now what's happened. And he told me that they were interested in picking up the documentary. And I said this at the premiere, um, but I'll say it again with working with them, you know, this project, like, so I made the whole thing. Right. But there's so much work that has to be done after I hit export on the final video to get this thing where people can watch it. And I feel like with disruptive sports group, 
you know, I'm running a relay race and I'm handing off a baton to Usain Bolt to fi- to finish this race. Like they're some of the best in the world at this stuff. So when it came to the premiere, that thing was incredible. You've seen the photos and video from it. Like they've been amazing. Now, is there, uh, do you know any of the, we know the short form goal, you know, helped get this out there, hype Joe up, you know, but what about the, what about long-term? What do you, what do you see coming from this in terms of a long form goal? I mean, when I first talked with Disruptive Sports Group, they asked me what my main goals were with the film was. And I was like, I want as many people to see this as possible because I really think, I mean, you've seen it. And this isn't me, you know, hyping myself up my filmmaking abilities. I think it's really just Joe's story that if people can watch Joe's story, that I think it changes you in a way, like it inspires you and motivates you. So for me, short term, I want as many people to see it as possible. And long term, I want as many people to see it as possible. Um, because I really think that it, it can have an impact on people who watch it. Hey, well, honestly, that's that's great. I and, and you know, one thing that I really do hope, you know. I want people like Joe, you know, because without when I was watching this, it really hit me in ways that you know I was I, I wasn't really expecting. I really liked the idea of someone like Joe, you know, someone who came from a pretty pretty rough family to see this and be like, you want to know what? Hard work, determination. There is a way I can, you know, I can get this life that I want, that I can be successful, that I don't need to technically be bound by you know right. the last great, name great. of worse men that i can form it into that of greater men and joe i I'm, i this will be the only really hard question that i will ask you and you do not have to answer it at all there are no hard questions um all right well if that's the case you know it's mentioned in the doc that your family life was not let's just put it lightly it wasn't necessarily the best you know, and I, I am wondering, you know, we know about your relationship with you, with your father, but um, one thing that was never touched upon is the relationship with your mom. Do you just, do you still reach out to her? Does she reach out to you? Not at all. Not at all. Three years plus now, not one word. That's, <clears throat> I'm really sorry to hear that, but you seem to be doing well. You seem to be, you seem to have a support group that loves you and supports you. So I, I guess no harm, no foul. Here, here, here's how that, here's how I view this, right? Cause some days, some days I long for family, right? You know, I don't have any, I don't have any blood family that's in my life and I can't, I can't necessarily call, like I could call them. I could reach out, you know what I mean? I could probably try, but here, here's the way I look at it. The things that I want to accomplish and the things that I want to do, they don't align with those type of people. And, um, the only thing that I know for certain is that they don't want to be successful the way I do. They don't want to go to the limits of breaking that I do. They don't strive for anything that is almost unbelievable, but is achievable. You know what I mean? So I just, I don't want to put myself around people like that, that want to live in the past and look in the rear view the rest of their life. I want to move forward. I want to see the world. I want to, believe that people are good i want to love i want to love people you know what i mean and 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 they aren't people that make me feel love they aren't people that desire to be in my life just to be in my life they want to be in my life because of money or they want to be in my life to say hey why'd you say this or why is that or what about what dad did this? what about when we did this or what like they swear that they've done something to really help me get to where I am in some ways, but it's crazy because I haven't really had a relationship with my sisters or my mom for that long since I've moved away at, you know, 15, 16 years old, which was only a couple months before I left him, you know, left my dad when I moved to PA. So we lived in Jersey. I moved to PA was only there for a couple months living with him throughout the school year and then ran away. So it's like, um, you know, uh, in that 10 year period, it's like, I probably talked to them on and off maybe two, three years by mom, you know, my sisters, I'll never say anything bad about my sisters because they're young. Um, I think life hasn't hit them in a way where they have been able to get away from either. Like, you know, I, I know none of my sisters talk to my dad like that at all. I know my youngest hasn't. I know my second youngest sister hasn't. And I know my oldest sister hasn't. I know the second oldest, the one that's older than me, I have four sisters. Um, I know she's talked to him here and there, but um, 
you know, he just manipulates everybody. So it's it's not he just wants to know what's going on with my mom and my other sisters. Like he doesn't give a shit about this sister whatsoever. But uh, you know, it's a toxic circle, man. Like these 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 people, all they do is talk shit on each other. If me and you were cool and we're brothers, the other two, the other family members are talking shit because they don't like that we're cool with each other. It was always a divided, hateful. And they've never gotten over the past, to be honest. So every time I've ever talked to them, it's all, well, dad did this and dad did that. It's like, man, I don't want to regurgitate that shit no more. I want to fucking, I want to move forward. I want to laugh. And I, I want to have a good time. I don't want I don't want to talk about the past every time I fucking see these people. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's some angry, disgruntled people and I just don't want to be around it. So I'm not upset about it. It is what it is. You know, some days, like Mother's Day, it's like, shit, I see everybody posting their mom. You know what I mean? It bothers me a little bit. Father's Day, you know, same shit. Like, it is what it is, man. Th these are the cards I've been dealt. I got two hands. I got two lungs. I got lungs. I got two legs. I got a healthy brain, I hope. And uh, I got a heart full that's ready to fucking take on the world, man. So I ain't got too much to complain about. I'm not going to say anything to you. And, and, and I'm fucking good at Warzone, as Chandler. <laughs> Okay, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everyone says they're good at Warzone, but I'll have you know. I've, bodies a game. Okay, well, I'll have you know, I, I've only died every single game of Warzone. <laughs> uh, I'm, so I'm so bad. I'm so bad. But no. Have you won? Um, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, you cut out what? Have you ever won? Um, once, but that was only because I, uh, that was only because I had a riot shield and a guy threw a grenade at me and the grenade bounced off and blew up in his face. Wow. So I won on a technicality. I never won due to skill. Um, uh, but sorry, one thing I, I wanted to say, and this is just mainly to compliment you is that I, I have a couple friends who less necessarily their, their home life was never great. But what I will say is that usually it results of one of two things it results in either worse men being made or better men being made and i am very glad to see you're falling into the latter category thank you i appreciate it i mean look i got i got people i call family you know chandler being one of them you know david david stevens is my best friend and you know uh you know i got a lot of good people around me so will Harmon being one of my best friends too you know what i mean so look at the people that i decide to say that i want to call family you know what i mean like that's i'm doing good i got i got a support system like you said if i ever needed to make that call i know i can make that call but i don't i don't not talk to these people on you know on a on, on a daily or weekly basis like i talk to all of these people you know what i mean so um i don't need any new people i got a solid support system and to the moon, baby. <laughs> to the moon. I, I, that's, that's, that's a great outlook on life, man. I can't fucking complain or even argue with that. Um, oh, look at that time. Um, I won't, I won't keep you guys up much more. I know you got, I know you got things to do. I know you, Joe. You have to train. Uh, you got to be the I best. Not. And... I not. <laughs> oh, oh shit! That's right. The fucking surgery. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Um, but let's. Let's let's try to get this uh, nice little full circle thing here going. So, Chandler, uh, first qu this last question will be for you. Uh, well, second to last question, and that is, you uh, you're a filmmaker. So the thing I always like asking filmmakers is, what do they uh, have coming up? What what's what's next on their on their docket, or what are their goals? What are the things they want to do? Is there anything uh, that we can look forward to? in uh in terms of uh you as a filmmaker or is there anything that you want to make that you're just dying to get done i mean i love documentaries because you know one of the things i said at the premiere of this film is that joe's story is so unbelievable that if i wrote it out as like a narrative film like a fictional film that i i do think the script would be critiqued and say hey that's that's not realistic enough we gotta we gotta tone down some of the adversity but when you have a documentary you know, this is all real true stuff. So I definitely want to make more sports documentaries. I'll definitely be following Joe for the rest of his career um, because we all know great things will happen there. But aside from that, um, right now I have a baby on the way that's going to be born in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, so hopefully, you know, thank you. Thank you. Just take some time. Enjoy what's happening with this film. Well, I am planning some things, but nothing I can talk about right now. Um but no, I'm really excited to pick something up later in this year and continue to work with Joe on this. 
Well, that's honestly great to hear. One, um, uh, hopefully you're, uh, hopefully I wish you and, uh, your partner a very, very, uh, good, just good birth. Cause I know sometimes things happen, but no, just wishing for the best. Okay. Thanks, um, man. and for you, Joe, you are a, you are, you so far have no losses. You are a middleweight champion. So what I want to know is who do you want to fight? Who is, who is a fighter that you just want to get into the octagon with and go toe to toe with? Fucking Dustin Stoltz first. I'm going to keep saying it as long as he's contracted to the UFC because my arm no ill will towards the guy, but I would love to fight him. If he's not on the list, I'll take Rodolfo Vieira. If he's not on the list, I'll take Derek Brunson. If he's not on the list, then uh, I'll fucking go back to the the drawing board and look at the the the, the people there. But you know, look, I could have been fought in the in the in the, the top fifteen already, but I'm not I'm not rushing my career. I'm 26 years old. I finally got to the UFC. I know I only fought once in like the past six fucking months, but hey, listen. My body has been doing this for years, and I want to have a longevity in the sport, and I don't want to lose ever in the UFC. So I'm going to do this right. I'm going to keep getting better, and I'll never take a fight unless I got better. So, you know, I got to rehab this. I got five, six weeks of this, and, and then I'll get back in the gym, like actually punching and rolling again, and I'll train for one or two months and, and see how my body feels, make sure that my shoulders healed up. I had a slap tear in my labrum as well, so – once I get that going, I'm hoping maybe like August, September, we'll figure it out. But uh, yeah, stay tuned, man. I'm going to merc all these motherfuckers. Like, I'm, none of these guys are my friends. They're trying to take my name. And every time somebody steps across that cage, it's because they think they're better than me. So fuck them. And uh, I'm going to break their faces and, and get, get paid. And uh, yeah, I mean, shit, I'll fight Bone Nickel too. So I would love to fight him. But, you know, I know he's like a prospect. He's got his own fights, so I'll let him have his shit. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, they all can get it, bro. They all can get it. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah, dude. That, see, that's the shit I like to hear. I always like hearing fighters just like getting ready. Like, you want to want, I'm fucking ready. Let's do this. I, I'm, I know I'm the best and I want to fight someone who's worthy. <laughs> of fighting. Look, hey, look, they all can get it, but you better pay me so they all can get it. That's, that's the only stipulation. That's the only thing that gets in the way. If I'm going to fight top 15 guys, then I want a top 15 pay. I know guys that's in the top 15 that have less followers than me, and I've only had two fights in the UFC, but they had 10 fights in the UFC. So, you know what I'm saying? Make it make sense. I'll fight anybody and everybody. Respect. That's all. I'm fair. I'm fair. So, that's all. All right. Um, You want to know what? Nothing but respect. Nothing but respect for you, Joe. Nothing but respect for you, Chandler. Honestly. Watching Journey to the UFC was a really remarkable experience, seeing your life and how you got to where you're at, Joe. And Chandler, just the way you handled Joe's story was uh, very personal, very heartfelt. And uh, I was hooked from the moment it started to the moment it ended. And I honestly wish nothing but the best for both of you going forward, whether that be for your career, whether that be for your family, and whether that just be for good health and goodwill. So I really would love, I just love to thank you guys for joining me today. And it really, it re really means so much to be able to get the chance to talk to both of you. Thanks for asking good questions and not being a fucking herd that pissed me off with some of the questions. Cause some of these people, man, sheesh, you're a good interviewer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank I you. Agree. Thanks for the good questions, Noah. Hey, no problem, man. Take care of y'all and have a great rest of your day.